read from Matthew to kind of get our thoughts started. So today we'll read from John one verse, John chapter five verse thirty nine. If you remember last time when we discussed the what Americans generally believe regarding God and sin. Today I'd like us to look at what we believe regarding the church and worship and regarding the Bible. So John chapter 5 verse 39 here Jesus is on a bit of a lengthy discourse and he says search the scriptures for any of you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Amen. And I think that's as we'll see later on in our lesson that searching the scriptures is not something that's done very often today. You're right. I don't know. I know part of it probably because we have a short attention span. It'll be like little quick little blurbs from preachers and the word of God and such. That's why we have that's why things such as TikTok and other so forms of social media are so popular because right you get a short little video or a short little saying and those things can be useful but also you can those things can be taken the, the wrong way mm -hmm. and the problem with sometimes just taking a simple verse or part of a verse is you don't always get the full context of it amen that's why we are to search the scriptures. It's it. We are to know not just our a few handful of verses, but we should know all of the scriptures. Amen. Well, of, of the church and worship, the Americans have a pretty poor view, I think. Uh, according to this study that we referenced, the state of theology, it says that 66% of Americans believe that God accepts the worship of all of the religions. Mm -hmm. well, there's numerous problems with that thing. Mm -hmm. We turn back to Exodus chapter 20, we'll see what we call the Ten Commandments here. They very clearly teach against this idea that God has all forms of worship. <laughs> We'll go ahead and read the first five verses. So then God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which I have brought, which I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the house, or excuse me, out of the land of Egypt by the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Amen. Thou shalt make, for thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath. For that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children of the third and fourth generation of them in the Haiti. Amen. No, verse 6 as well. It says, And showing mercy unto the thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Mm -hmm. So here, Jehovah God, the Lord God, he pronounces, if you will, a ban on all other gods, mm -hmm. all other forms of idol worship. Really, a, a worshiping any god besides him is not pleasing to the Lord God of the Bible. I wonder sometimes what Moses was thinking when he came down after getting that very command and they're worshiping a golden calf. Right. You know, we got angry enough to throw down the tablets and break them. Mm -hmm. Yet, Americans believe that God is just accepting of all forms of worship. Of all, the other problem is other religions don't worship the same God of the Bible. You're right. Buddhism, they do not worship Jehovah God. Amen. Hinduism, they teach that there are many gods. Native Americans, they believe in the great spirit, but they also often see other little gods and things. Right. 
of the God of the Muslims and not Jehovah. They, they, they believe in some truths of the, that are found in scriptures. They have co-opted the, the Old Testament, or at least the first portion of the Pentateuch, and corrupted it. If you actually study the Quran at all, you'll find that it teaches that the, the Bible, including the Gospels, was a revelation from, quote, Allah. Right. But they don't actually worship the God of the Bible. That's right. So Isaiah chapter 42, turn there real quick. Isaiah 42, verse 8. Here, the Lord is speaking through the prophet Isaiah, and he says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Amen. God was not going to accept your taking his glory and his splendor and his really anything that belongs to him and attributing it to some other god or idol. Mm -hmm. well, that's one of the reasons why I have a problem with figures such as Santa Claus, because they take the attributes that belong solely to God and give it to some anime yeah. creature. You're right. But saying that God accepts worship of all religions is doing the same thing. It's taking that things that belong to the Lord God Jehovah alone and attributing it to these other gods. Mm -hmm. you know, the gods of the Greeks and Romans, they are not equal unto Jehovah God. The gods of our pagan ancestors, they are not equal unto the Lord God Jehovah. He is not pleased if we take any of his glory, any of his splendor, any of his attributes and equate them under one of those gods. So the world has this idea of Father Time and Mother Nature, but you know God is very much the God of those things as well. Amen. Amen. So now God is not going to just accept worship in whatever form you think is worship. In fact, let's go over to John chapter 4. I think you'll find the, the key to what True worship is John chapter 4, verse 24. We all probably know this scripture, but you know, without getting into the details of what exactly defines worship, I think we could agree that us meeting here together and singing songs of praise to God that is a portion of worship. Amen. Yeah. You're falling down on your face before Him is how. Many times worship is portrayed in the scriptures. Amen. But here, if you're familiar with the context here, that John, or me, Christ is speaking to the Samaritan woman, and they, the Samaritans, they taught they were to worship in the mountains. The Jews taught that they were to worship in the temple. The Christ here says, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen. Without those two components, you cannot truly worship God. In other religions, they do not have truth, do they? They might have a little portion of something that's true, but they don't have the truth of the Word of God. Amen. And I'd say they don't have the right spirit either. Many so-called religions are carnal in nature or Many of them are glorifying to man rather than glorifying to God. Amen. And I'd say without being born again, it's difficult, if not impossible, for man to truly worship God. Amen. All one day, one day all will bow before him and all will confess to Christ as Lord. You can be sure of that. You can be also sure that God is not just tolerant of every religion that goes on in this world. Mm. You're right. Man is very ignorant of 
who God is. I think we saw that very clearly last week, but because of that, they think God is just some old happy-go-lucky old man sitting up in the clouds somewhere. But that is not the God of the Bible. You're right. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. We must worship him for who he is, the creator of all the universe. Man. He is not equal to God's other religions. He is not just happy that you acknowledge him that he is God. The devils also believe and tremble. Amen. And we prescribe in his word how he is to be worshipped and we are to follow that. If this isn't in my notes, but the sons of Eli, they were killed because they didn't worship correctly. That's right. Let's go on to our next point here. 67% of Americans believe that worshiping alone or with someone's family is a valid replacement for regularly attending church. That's really not surprising when you have a little view of the church, which that's really kind of our next point. But when you think God just accepts any kind of worship, then certainly it makes sense that you know, I can worship anywhere. And certainly individually we can worship Him when we're alone. But that doesn't excuse our coming together to worship Him. <coughs> the most commonly cited verse of this is, of course, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, that we are to go ahead and read that for us. <laughs> we some, we may have some debate on if that's referring to church attendance or some other event. But Hebrews 10, verses 24 to 25 say, let us consider one another to provoke into love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, and so much the more, or as manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Amen. We are to gather together, God's people, want to exhort one another, to encourage one another. See, yeah, as we'll see here in a little bit. Church isn't just supposed to be a, a social gathering. Right. We're here to come together to corporately worship God and to also to edify the saints. <laughs> In fact, we won't turn there, but I think we all know Matthew 18, verse 20, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Amen. Yeah. And he is speaking in a church setting there. He just, in the previous few verses that address church discipline, He's not talking about you know, me and Brother Larry going, hanging out somewhere. Or, you know, it's me and Hannah and Adam and Sarah all hung out Friday night went out to eat. That doesn't mean God was necessarily in our midst just because we were gathered together. You know? <laughs> Gathering together, together in his name is in the church service. Right. Well, I've seen a uh, thing on, I think it was on Facebook recently proclaiming that God is not in the church, he's in you. Mm. <laughs> well, God is in us if you're saved, but he's also in his church. Amen. He meets together with his people. And we see that even in the Old Testament temple, he came down in the temple on various occasions. We do know we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us if we are born again today, but okay. That God meets with his people is in various examples throughout the New Testament as well. On the day of Pentecost, we see that God mightily moved among the church there. We see it in other places where saints were gathered together praying and God met with them. So I know Brother Adam is often pointing out Christ is our great example of how we ought to be regularly in the house of the Lord. Amen. Luke chapter 4, verse 16. After his time with the devil in the wilderness, it says, And he came, speaking of Christ in Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on Sabbath day and stood up for a read. Amen. 
It was the, the custom of the practice of the will of Christ to be in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And really, so should it be for us that we are in the house of the Lord on the Lord's day. Mm -hmm. yeah. We could get into the debates about what is the Sabbath day and all that, but that's not the point of our topic today. In the time of Christ, it was to go into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. That was your, quote, religious duty. That's where God's people met together. Mm -hmm. And for us in the, our age, it is our duty to meet together with God's people in his church on the Lord's day. Amen. Let's go to Psalms 122, and I think we'll see the real issue with most people not wanting to worship together in the church. Psalm 122, David speaking here. And I'm sure we've all heard this scripture before as well, but Psalm 122, verse number one says, I was glad, and they said unto me, Let us go unto the house of the Lord. Amen. The reason most people think that they are just fine worshiping God alone is because they really don't have any desire to go into the house of the Lord, do they? They would rather be out on the lake or the golf course or doing some other thing. But over and over again, we see in scriptures examples and precedents of how we ought to be with God's people in the house of the Lord. Amen. And yes, the church is God's house. It's called the house of the Lord in the New Testament today. Paul calls it that very clearly in his letters to, the, to Timothy. <laughs> he gives guidance on how one ought to behave himself in the house of the Lord, he says in one scripture. Amen. <laughs> he calls the church the pillar and ground of the truth in another place. Yeah, that kind of, it's going to lead us kind of into our next point here that only 37% of Americans believe every Christian has an obligation to join a local church. Mm -hmm. If you have such a low view of the church, then you, there's really no point in gathering together and worship God as a church, is there? Right. I think there's a widespread misunderstanding of the nature of Christ's church today, though. Although I would say some of that's a failure on our part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We are to go in all the world and to teach people. You know, first, obviously, we are to preach the gospel to them, but then we need to teach the truth of the Word of God after that. But the word church literally means an assembly or a congregation. Amen. You know, we have these people today that want to just make it some invisible theory. No, the church is a called out local assembly. That's the only thing it can be. And because people don't understand that today, they, if they have a misunderstanding of what it means to be a church, what a church is, mm -hmm. and really the importance of the church itself. Christ himself, though, said that he would build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Did Christ put such importance on the church and we ought to have a high view of it as well. He's, Amen. And the church is described as bride in the book of Ephesians chapter 5. I want to go over to Acts chapter 2 though we'll see very early on in the existence of the church of Jerusalem that there were people joining unto them. Right. Acts chapter 2 we're going to read verses 41 through 47. After Peter was preaching, it says, Then they that gladly received his word, verse 41, were baptized, and the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Amen. And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayer, and fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. That sounds awful lot like an assembly, doesn't it? They were yeah. made together. It says, and they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. 
And they continue in daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house. No statement. Sometimes in the temple, sometimes from house to house. It said they eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. <laughs> Even from this very early instance, there were people being added to the church. And yes, this wasn't a local gathering together of people. Mm -hmm. They gathered in the temple, they gathered in people's houses. They continued steadfastly, and it says, in fellowship and breaking of bread. Oh, I can't break bread with Brother Larry over the phone, can I? Right. And even back then, you couldn't do it if he was in one house and I was in another house. Right. The church is and always has been a, an assembly of the people. But I don't know how many were in the Church of Jerusalem, it was a very large congregation at this point. And we know some would go out from them, they would eventually be dispersed by Paul and his persecution. Mm -hmm. But again, then you see new churches being started in other places, don't you? Let's go over to the book of Ephesians. The same idea is also in the book of Corinthians. <laughs> Corinthians chapter 12, in fact, but Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 16. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 through 16. Here speaking to the church, which is at Ephesus, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfection of the saints for the work and ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and the perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive but speaking the truth and love may grow up in him all things which is the head, even Christ. Amen. Christ is the head of the church. Try it. Verse 16 goes on to say, From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, making the increase of the body and the edifying of itself in love. Amen. When over in 1 Corinthians 12, I believe it is, it says that he set some in the church, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers. Mm -hmm. He's given to his churches the, these different offices, these different positions, if you will, for a reason. He says that we might all come in unity of the faith with the knowledge of the Son of God, that we no more be henceforth children tossed to and fro. The, problem, the purpose of church, aside from the spreading of the gospel, is that we might support one another spiritually, Amen. and times physically too, that we might help one another to grow in faith, and we might encourage one another, as, we, as Hebrews said, that we might exhort one another, and we might provoke them to, to love and to good works. So trying to be a... <laughs> Outside of the Lord's church is like a, a sheep trying to wander from the fold. Mm -hmm. You're very prone to attacks. You're very easily targeted by the wolves. <laughs> and so it is with a Christian who tries to walk with the Lord outside of the Lord's church. He's opened himself up to the attacks of Satan very easily. He's opened himself up to the attacks of false teachers and false doctrines. <laughs> The point of a pastor and teacher is that help us to know and understand the Word of God even more fully. Amen. The purpose of us coming together is that we might also we might hold one another accountable. Mm -hmm. See, that's what you lose when you really deregulate the church down to something other than a local assembly. Right. 
when you just have some some invisible body in the sky, as some people seem to teach, that <laughs> you lose that accountability, you lose really the purpose of encouraging one another, exhorting one another, of having faithful pastors and teachers and so Amen. on. Amen. You know, I can I can learn stuff from watching and listening to other men, but ultimately we have uh, Larry here as our pastor. We have currently me now as our as teachers. But we have a important how would I say have an important part in edifying saints, don't we? Amen. So without without the church, we're we're easily or we can be easily tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. You know, I know of a, a fellow that I went to school with, and he one time he was a member of a, he believed a little bit like we did, pretty close to like we did. And for a little while, he went off to the Presbyterians and then to the Lutherans and. Now he was an Eastern Orthodox or something like that. <laughs> That's what happens when you're not in a good sound church. Is you can easily drawn this way and drawn that way by everything that sounds good. Right. And as much as we would like to think we're really good and strong and won't follow the false doctrine, we're a lot weaker than we want to Admit that we are. You're right. Let's we'll turn over. Let's we'll turn to First Corinthians 12 for just a moment. I'm not going to read this whole passage. The way the whole chapter speaks of the church as a body. It was referenced there in Ephesians 4 as well. The church as a body, fitly joined together. Mm -hmm. Notice a few verses here though. For Ephesians, or excuse me, First Corinthians 12. Verse 14 says, For the body is not one member, but many. Amen. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not the body, is therefore not the body? If the whole body were an eye, or where were the hearing? If the whole, if the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But God has set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. Amen. Amen. Verse 20 is, uh, is it, go ahead and keep reading there. Verse 19 says, And if they were all one member, where was the body? But now are they many members, but one body. Amen. And if you notice verse 27, it says, Now ye are the body of Christ members in particular. Mm -hmm. The church is the body of Christ, and we are all members in particular. We all have our particular function and purpose in the church. Amen. All cannot be. The pastor, all cannot be the song leader, all cannot be the Sunday school teacher. No, God has his purpose for each and every one of us in his church. We don't need to be like the Corinthians though and think, well, I'm not as good because I'm not the head, or I'm not I'm not you know, I'm not the eyes, so I'm not as good as because I'm the ear or something like that. I'm not as good because I'm not the pastor, I'm not the teacher, I'm Yep, that's how many view themselves in the church of God, don't they? Mm -hmm. As insignificant as the kinky toe seems, if we were to lose that, our body would suffer, wouldn't it? Right. And so does the church of God. Without all its members in particular, it is not a full body. Back in verse 29, he says, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but come earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Mm -hmm. And you Larry did not have a gift of singing. I think we'll admit that pretty readily, but Man. yet others do have that gift. You know, some are better speakers than others, some are better at doing one job versus the other. Not all can be the same particular part of the body. Yet all parts of the body function together, that it might be one whole body, that it might be unity. 
Even when one part of the body is out of out of sync, then the whole body is out of sync, isn't it? Amen. And so it is with the church of God. We are all one body and we need to be in unity and one accord that we may do the work which God has given us to do. Let's go over to Acts chapter 9. I want to notice one thing here I had never noticed before. Shortly after the Lord saved Paul on the road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9, verse 26. It says, And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed or attempted to join himself to the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Mm -hmm. The church at Jerusalem did not want Paul to join their assembly initially, did he? Right. But we see that Paul. He attempted to join the church shortly after his salvation. We know by, at least by Acts 13, he was a member at the Church of Antioch. But this tells us, thank you, that people are to join into the local assembly. Amen. But also it shows that maybe not just everybody should be admitted into the local church. <laughs> now they had their the reasonable suspicions, but if you know the rest of the account here, Barnabas would take him to the apostles and explain that well, he really has been saved and he has done many wonderful things already. Even Paul himself, probably one of our greatest examples aside from Christ in the scriptures, he attempted to join himself with the local church. Right. And we know by exception. Definitely by Acts 13, he was a member of Antioch as he was sent out, him and Barnabas. So, people today have a, I think, a misunderstanding of the church, for one, Absolutely. what it is, what its purpose is. Yeah. And because of that, they have a pretty low view of the local church. Mm -hmm. I mean, For most people, they can get just as much from watching the TV as they can with meeting together in a supposed church. Mm -hmm. That's really a sad state for the, the church as a whole in America today. Well, let's go on to our next point before we run out of time here. And also, I think it's really the root cause of all the other problems that we've looked at. What Americans believe about the Bible. 53% believe that the Bible like all sacred writings, contains helpful accounts of ancient myths but is not literally true. Mm. <laughs> will, I've referenced two scriptures about, <laughs> about the Bible in our beginning of our each lesson. We'll search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Mm -hmm. And last week, you do err not knowing the scriptures. I think that is the root cause of it. People do not search the scriptures and they are in error regarding the scriptures. Right. And from there all these other things flow. John chapter 17 will begin a thought here on this. John chapter 17, we know this is where the Lord is praying to the Father. Praying specifically for his people. And he says in verse 17 of chapter 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Amen. So the word of God is really encompasses all of truth. Mm -hmm. Notice he says, sanctify them through thy word. That is, it means to set them apart. Mm -hmm. you know, if you truly believe the scriptures to be true, then that will set you apart from this world. But the Word of God is true, every bit of it. It's not just helpful accounts. <laughs> it's not just good advice. We can turn over to Proverbs chapter 30. We see uh, another principle brought out here, Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 5.
It says every word of God is pure. He's a shield of men they put their trust in him. Amen. But every word of God is pure, he says. Every word of God is it's without corruption, it's without deception, it's without even a little bit of a lie. Mm -hmm. Well, there is nothing that would dilute the truth of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. If it was just ancient myths with the, with the Jewish spin on it, then it would not be the pure Word of God. Amen. I'm not going to turn to these passages, but Matthew chapter 9, verses 4 through 5, here Jesus references and even quotes from Genesis as a true account. He said, Have you not read? That he which made them at the beginning made them both male and female. Amen. And then he quotes were that a man shall leave his father and mother, shall join, cleave to his wife, and they point shall be one flesh. And in Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39, Jesus references, references the blood of Noah's day as an actual account. Amen. As it shall be in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. And they were eating, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it says they were eating, they were drinking, and giving him marriage. And, not knowing <laughs> till the flood came and took them away. Amen. So shall it be when the Son of Man returns. But you know, those two are seem to be the most commonly attacked portions of the Word of God. The, the flood of Noah's day and the creation account are just seen as allegory or myths. Or, and yet, if Christ Himself references them as true events and they must be true. Amen. You know, this next point kind of goes along with that. They said only 51% of Americans believe that the Bible is 100% accurate in all that it teaches. Well, if you believe that it's full of this and fabled stories, then yeah, you would probably say it's not completely accurate, wouldn't you? Right. But the Bible is infallible is the word we use that it's without yeah. error it's, we turn over to Psalms 119 <laughs> Psalms 119 and verse 160 that was here the scripture says Thy word is true from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. Amen. That every portion of the word of God, every portion of the scriptures, they are true. Mm -hmm. That from the very beginning, really even you could say from the beginning down to the end, as the what is implied there, that they are true. But if they are not Really, if we would say that the scriptures are not 100% accurate, then we could we begin down any portion that we wanted to? Right. That is the the practical problem with downing the infallibility of the Word of God. Mm -hmm. when, we begin to, when we begin to say, well, I don't know if that's what that really means. That's really what Satan began with in the garden, wasn't it? Did God right. really say it? <laughs> Go over to 2 Timothy. I think we all know this passage of scripture, but it's relevant to what we're looking at here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Second Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. It says in that from a we're going to read verse 16 through 17. 15 through 17. That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise of salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, for instruction in righteousness. Amen. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in all good works. If, if every part of the word of God is not true, then every part is not profitable for doctrine for the proof correction for instruction of righteousness. Amen. As he says here, it's all given by inspiration of God. Or as Peter writes, that holy men 
of all moved as they were or speaking they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Yes, it was men's hands that penned the word, but it was the Holy Ghost moving in those men that wrote down the word of God. Amen. And because it is inspired of God and is 100% accurate in all that it teaches. If not, then the word of God is not true. And if not, then we might as well just shut it up and do what we want to do. That's it. Second Peter chapter 3, I want to point one thing that I hear this commonly taught today. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Some people say, well, that's just the words of the Apostle Paul. That's just they say the New Testament is not the scriptures. So, yep, you see here. <coughs> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says to me, An account that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Notice verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in things, or speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they are unlearned and un Stay, yeah. which they are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also other scriptures under their own destruction. Amen. We hear Peter says that Paul's writings are equal to the other scriptures. <laughs> that they are really of just as much authority as the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, for Jews at that time, that was very important, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. and we have today people who want to quote this is the words of one false prophet to unhitch the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, we know that the Old Testament was written for our learning. It, as we've seen very clearly in Romans, it's our law that our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It pointed us to our Savior. It showed us our seen sinfulness. Amen. You know, Christ is all throughout the Old Testament, both prophecies and types. Sometimes, even literally, I believe, when we see manifestations of them. Mm -hmm. You know, the words of the Apostle Paul are just as much the words of God as the quote red letters. Amen. And the Gospels and the Epistles, they are all equal in authority. Peter recognizes that. And if he does, I think we ought to as well. Mm -hmm. Are things to be hard understood? Most certainly. I think if, again, I think if Peter thought they were hard to be understood, then we, nearly 2,000 years later, most definitely have a hard time understanding some of these things. Yeah, bad. Yet from Genesis to Revelation, it is all the Word of God and it is all 100% accurate. <laughs> Lastly, in this it's kind of the logical conclusion when you don't believe the Word of God, when you don't believe the Bible is accurate, when you believe it's full of myths and fairy tales. It says 60% believe religion, or religious belief, is a matter of personal opinion. It's not about objective truth. Mm. Yeah, well, like I said, when you get rid of the Bible as the Word of God, and you say it's not accurate, then it's up to you to decide what is truth, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> it's up to you to decide what is right and wrong. Mm -hmm. The scriptures address that as well, though. Proverbs says that there's a way we seem to rise of man, and there are the ways of death. Amen. We see in other places that people sometimes did that which was right in their own eyes. The problem is that they never led them to God, did it? We go over to Matthew chapter 15. This is also recorded in Mark chapter 7. Matthew chapter 15, we're going to read verses 3 through 9 here. <coughs> we'll go ahead and start with verse 1. It says, Then came to Jesus, scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. If you know the Pharisees had lots of rules and regulations that they had to follow. Mm -hmm. Some of them not necessarily bad, but not based on scriptures either. Right. 
some of them in blatant <laughs> violation of the scriptures as well, though. Verse 3 says, But he, speaking of Christ, answered and said unto them, Why do ye transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Mm-hmm. I think is the, why most people think that religious belief is a matter of personal opinion, because they want to do their traditions, don't they? They want to do what, what they think is right. Right. And by doing so, they transgress the commandment of God. I kind of like the way that it said in Mark chapter 7, verse 9, but will you reject the commandment of God if you may keep your own traditions? Mm-hmm. He goes on to say here, verse 4, for God commanded, saying, honor thy father and mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die to death. So he gives the command of God, and he's then what they do instead. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or, or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have you made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. Amen. They, they twist the word of God to do what to make it fit their own belief system, if you will. Right. To make them fit what it makes them feel good. And that's why people value their own opinion over objective truth today. Mm-hmm. Amen. Continuing on, he says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw nigh unto me with their mouth, and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Mm-hmm. That's what happens when you rely on opinions rather than truth. You end up with the commandments of men and teaching them as if they're the doctrines of God. Right. Maybe not for other denominations, but for Baptists, one of our distinctives is that the Word of God is our source of truth. Amen. It doesn't really matter so much what the confessions say, it doesn't matter too much what the church fathers believed. (laughs) What ultimately matters is what they say in Scripture. Amen. But no, most people today they would rather have their traditions, their their pet doctrines, if you will, their opinions, rather than the truth of the Word of God. First Timothy chapter four, two more places and we'll bring this to a close. Taking up some of Larry's time here. First Timothy chapter four. Probably another familiar passage of scripture. Verses one through three say. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from the meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. See, here is the problem. Many today have been deceived by false doctrines, by false teachers, by as he called it here, seducing the spirits. And because of that, they they don't have the truth any longer, do they? Amen. But he says that's the way it shall be in the latter times. You know, you can believe what you want. If we, some people say 2,000 were in the last days. Some people say we've been in the last days since the time of Paul. Whatever may, your belief on that may be, you can be sure people are falling farther and farther away from the truth of the word. Amen. 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 Because of this very type of thing here, that they, rather than submitting to the scriptures, they submit to things that sound good, things that make the flesh feel good. Mm-hmm. Or as he <laughs> wrote, I'll show you, see if I can find that right quick. I think it's in 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter. Well, I know but I can't think of it at the moment where he tells that people shall heap to themselves, teachers have engineers. Mm-hmm. People 
today, by and large, want to hear something that feels good rather than the truth. You know, people don't like the Word of God because, as Hebrews 4.12 tells us, it's as sharp as any two-edged sword, piercing them the dividing of both soul and spirit. Amen. But it cuts all the way down to what we really are, and people don't like to hear that to me. John chapter 8, more close. Just, the Word of God doesn't sugarcoat things, it doesn't tell you how good you really are, it doesn't tell you things that will make you warm and fuzzy inside. Right. So people by and large reject that. They would rather have their own opinions or the teachings of man rather than the doctrines of God. Amen. John chapter 8, but here's the key. Really the only solution to all of these problems. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Again, familiar passages of scripture, I'm sure. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Opinions cannot make you free. Amen. Only the truth of the Word of God. We must continue in His words, it says, and then you are my disciples indeed. Amen. So we need to search the Scriptures for they are which testify of Christ. We need to not be in error regarding the Scriptures because we don't know them. Right. The average Christian, even the average Good Summer Grace Baptist day doesn't know the Word of God like we ought to know. You're right. And because of that, all these other errors come up. And we have no reason, we have no idea how to defend against them. Amen. You know, we'll follow Christ and then we shall know the truth. Mm -hmm. Follow anything else and we can be sure that we will fail. But the truth will make you free until, until you come to that point you're in bondage to the doctrines of men or the doctrines of devils. Right. <laughs> until you have to follow Christ and know this, this is the truth and everything else will take precedence. Everything else will lead you astray. Amen. But everything else will sound pretty good, won't it? Mm -hmm. Because the Word of God, it teaches you who you really are. It teaches who God really is. It teaches what salvation really is. And by and large, man doesn't like that today. And that's why he has such a low view of the scriptures, I believe. One, because no one is teaching the scriptures as they ought to anymore. But two, man would rather have his own tradition, his own feel-good things rather than the truth. Amen. That's why he has this popular saying, Oh, this is my truth. No, there's only one truth. Amen. Your opinion is not the truth. What Amen. God says that is the truth. We're going to close with that. Amen. <laughs>